So I hope all of you know that hackers are all around us, right? There's probably some in this room, but that's okay because we pay them. But the reality is, is that hacking these days is being uh, used to, inf to, uh oh, where's, There we go. Hacking is being used to take money from companies and extract things through things like ransomware, which is the screen on the left, as well as through uh, phishing attacks through uh, legitimate looking emails that actually are not. So real quick show of hands, I have no idea how this is gonna go. How many people know somebody that has been affected by something like ransomware or a hacking attempt or a, or a uh, identity theft? Scary, isn't it? So security analysts love it when the attacks are really, really easy to find, like those two big spikes on the left, that's a DDoS attack. Unfortunately, most things are buried in noise of more normal looking network traffic like the graph on the right. And that's actually where most of the attacks that I just talked about start off. So the Gossied project is being run at ISI to specifically try and attack some of these problems head on. Uh, it's run by a number of participants from both the Networking and Cybersecurity Division, the Analog Intelligence Division, and Parsons, our subcontractor. We have a, a, an approach to Gossied where we are bringing in domain expertise from three different areas of the tech transfer tree. We're bringing in computer scientists that have advanced theory and new approaches to tackling some of these problems, internet engineers that really have insights into how networks work and how protocols work, and then finally network operators that are actually able to provide uh, relevant results to figure out which of the our resulting uh, anomalies that we're detecting uh, are the most important. We use protocol awareness and trend detection to try and find some of these signals and look for these buried signals so that we can determine that they are important. We reveal and amplify the, the weakest of them so that we can actually notice them. And then we identify emerging global threats, which I'll give you an example of in, in a few minutes. Our machine learning team is learning to classify, prioritize, and correlate signals because operators are already overwhelmed. It's very easy to find a ton of things, but finding the important ones is very difficult. And we give all of this to existing operators today so that we can get very early feedback for how well our techniques and research is working. Next. There we go. So early in the Gossied program, we had some success with our popularity percentage algorithm that was used to amplify weak signals. We do this by decomposing signals into a whole bunch of sub-signals, which improves the signal-noise ratio so that we can detect events of importance. Another I important uh, component is that we look for signal substitution. So the graph on the right, you'll notice that the blue line drops while the attack traffic shown above it goes up. That actually allows us to, rather than looking for every single one of the little tiny signals, we can look at one major signal to figure out with trend analysis, when is the important time that we dive down into details to look at, at the, the greater number of signals. Fortunately, our approach is quite general, so that it actually transforms, this was a DNS-related graph, but the next graph uh, is about rootkits. So when somebody compromises a, a, an enterprise network or a corporation or an institute like ours, the first thing that they do is they download their own software to help them spread and help them take over the machine and the rest of the networks nearby. The blue squares on the far left hand side are uh, one rootkit called gtop.sh and you can see that in June of 2018 it began falling in popularity as the operators uh, got to the next one. So the orange and the green ones on to the right were the next rootkits that they were downloading. This is only over the course of a few months and you can see that the last one called weed.sh uh, rose in popularity while the rest of them fell. Our trend analysis techniques are able to look for this type of thing and when trends are occurring on a monthly basis, that's impossible for operators to follow. For the machine learning approach, we have dived into uh, this is an anomaly graph that shows a rise in traffic uh, that is actually much more complex to look at in order to figure out correlation. So why do we want to see correlation? Why do we want to know that things are happening together? Correlation ends up uh, highlighting collaboration. So we know that attackers are working together or we know that multiple remote machines are actually operating in synchronicity. So in this graph, you'll notice that the bumps are to the left, the right, and the middle. Um, that little white box that just appeared is all white because there's no correlation, there's no collaboration happening. Uh, the red diagonal box is always red in these types of graphs for those that understand them. Uh, next graph. The left-hand bumps, you'll notice that all of a sudden these boxes have lit up in red. That shows that there actually is a correlation and there's a collaboration that is happening between the hosts that are contributing to that left-hand graph. 
the right-hand graph, you'll notice, has a different set of hosts that are collaborating to bring about the right-hand uh, anomaly. So you can see that there's two different sets of things that are happening here that are, not, that are independent, and we can actually notice a shift in behavior. What's fascinating to me is that in the middle, all of those hosts are collaborating together. So temporally across this, this uh, day's worth of data, attackers are actually shifting from one set of hosts to another as the time goes on. This level of, of uh, correlation allows us to tell operators that things are changing, that the threat landscape is changing, and that they should know to immediately start looking for new things. All of this is useless if we can't actually tell network operators what's the important thing, how do you understand the events that are happening. We can come up with fantastic machine learning algorithms and fantastic statistical algorithms, but if operators can't understand it, they don't know what to do. So our solution to this is we developed a, a threat feed. So the boxes on the left indicate my, my threat feed sources. This actually we just went live last week in a restricted fashion. And we're identifying things on the internet that are uh, possibly a threat to every enterprise. Those threat feeds feed into a enterprise-specific analyzer that are able to look at the traffic coming through their own networks and look through their networking logs to see if they have a match. Next. When an event is actually found, we tag, we know where it came from, we can reach back to the source, and we can feed it into a report generator. These report generators are designed to be able to very quickly and easily, in a logical fashion, lay stuff out so that when we provide it into a ticketing system, we end up with a report which is fact-based, it's human readable. It is logical flow from the beginning to the end. We have things like an executive summary equivalent at the top. We have things that, that explain this is what we saw, this is why we saw it, and this is why it's important to you. It's prioritized so that we know, that the operators know that we need to look at these tickets before these other ones. Uh, one thing I've learned from operators in this whole process of, of in, uh, interrogation and, and working with them is they don't care about numbers. One to ten scales don't work for them. Only red, green, and blue. They just only care about things that are red. They don't have the, the mathematical background to even understand the difference between an eight and a nine. If I told you that one threat was an eight and another one was a nine, would you know what, you know, how, how important that was? You don't, right? If I told you it was red, you're immediately thinking of it as much more dangerous. So the success in our Gossied program, in the Chase program, which is called Cyber Hunting at Scale, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't read that, that title earlier. Oh, we missed this, the Chase slide. Uh, too late. <laughs> so Chase is the DARPA program that, that this is being run under, and I'll give you the quick summary. It's called Cyber Hunting at Scale, and their belief is that enterprises have way too much data transversing the network, much more than you can even log the disk, and much more that you can, than you can take a look at. We don't have the computational resources to even look at the amount of data that is being written to disk at all. And humans can't understand even all of the reports that come out. So there's a huge scale issue with respect to the amount of data that's getting logged, and the amount of data that we're able to analyze, and the amount of data that humans can actually look at. Um, so, we are uh, researching new threat detection and correlation events that we will uncover the, uh, the underlying attacks that I was talking about at the beginning, some of which are, are knowledgeable to you that you're familiar with, like the ransomware attacks, uh, attacks I talked about before, and others of which are uh, you know, much more complex networking uh, problems. We feed these into an engineering system that produces stories and that engineers can able to tell us uh, what are the most important things, what are the protocols that are being used today that actually have security related events that will matter to network operators as opposed to things you might be able to ignore. And we feed all of this into the operators and they come back and give us a, a quantification for how well does this story actually help them out. In the end, there's something in the industry called continual integration. In fact, I had a conversation about it over lunch with Ryan. Continual integration is the process of continually pushing out new development. Things like Facebook and Amazon use this on a regular basis in order to promote their changes. They're pushing out changes very rapidly. As all of you know, when you go to a new website and it looks different the next day from the day before, right? That's continual integration. They're pushing stuff out. My argument to you is that we can do this on the research side too, by giving research into uh, by turning our research work into engineers, into operators, we can get early feedback that improves our research. And our result is actually quite, been quite successful. We're sort of being used as a role model within the program in terms of our success, and other uh, participants are actually sort of copying the way that we've laid out of our work. Uh, the future for, for Gossied is that in the, in the hopefully the option that we pick up in May, we will end up uh, 
per, 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 excuse me, putting some of our new technologies into live networks and discovering real events at real time. And that's our goal. Any questions? <laughs> And I apologize for the two slides that were skipped. Oh, well. <laughs> I have a question regarding the cost. Can this be deployed in a blockchain network? Uh, can you repeat that one more time? I'm uh, sorry. Can this be deployed in a blockchain network? Uh, that's a good question. Our algorithms are generic, so there's no reason that we couldn't try and do something like that. I, I'll have to think you know, further about that. Our blockchain networks and, and those components are sort of in the, all the rage right now. A lot of people are thinking about using it for DNS and related things. Um, I'll stick that in the back of my mind and reach out to me. I'd love to talk more about it. Anna Mirkovic from uh, the Marine Del Rey office. Um, I have a question about the uh, validated by operators part. So you're working with some operators. Can you talk more about that relationship and how easy was it to get them to adopt your tool and to give you feedback? How often did you have to go back to them? Thank you for asking about a missing slide. Um, <laughs> uh, so two things. <coughs> Some of us actually on the project run operational networks ourselves. Um, I run an operational network for ISI. Some of the people in Parsons are also running networks so that we have that immediate feedback for what's important in there. And Parsons in particular is deploying some of our technology there. And then yes, DARPA has uh, 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 affiliates that they're actually working with. And so we regularly interact on actually on a weekly basis with the operators there. And that's actually where we get the feedback. And in fact, next week I have a meeting with some real security officers at, at government networks to give me feedback on the reports that I generated for them to get to get feedback, and that's actually been highly successful. Okay, let's thank our speaker. All right, thank you.